Well, this morning, this morning I'm very, very excited. I know I say this a lot, but I'm very excited about the text that we're going to be diving into this morning. Uh, but before I get to that, I just want to, just, just in case you caught, you missed something, you didn't catch, when Dr. Ron, as I like to call him, Ron Young, he is a doctor, by the way, he's got a PhD, um, he was mentioning the chili, but I don't know, did you catch that it's a chili cook-off? Did you catch that? See, some of the more competitive people in the room caught that. Yes, we're all going to enjoy chili, and some of you are going to be able to compete. So it's a win-win. So I'm inviting you two weeks from today, um, my wife Karen, I don't know where she is, there she is, she's back in the back. Many of you know Karen, if you don't, she's going to be out underneath the orange umbrellas after the service because we want you to sign up to either bring chili, bring your best recipe, bring your best recipe, you're going to have to take on Jerry, you're going to have to take on my son, they, they make some pretty, pretty amazing chili. So uh, sign up to bring chili or to bring a side. Maybe you're like, I'm not into chili. That's okay. We need salads. So bring, bring a side. Sign up to serve. We, we, we need some help. This is going to be a great day. We're just going to go right from worship. God's going to move in a powerful way. I know it. And then we're going to move right over there to that building and we're going to have some chili together. So it's going to be really relaxed and really fun. So uh, please don't, don't skip that and sign up. If you can just touch base with Karen, like I said, she'll be under the orange umbrellas. And also, I'm not going to take a lot of time. Um, we'll dive into it a little bit more next week. We're at the six-month mark in, after our annual meeting. So in March, um, we, we gather as a church. We, uh, we talk about our budget, we approve our budget, we appoint deacons to serve our church body, and we're about halfway uh, through the year since it's been about six months since March, and several people have been asking for, hey, updates and stuff like that, and like, it'd be great if we kept updates on a bulletin board. Well, we don't have a bulletin board. But we have this. So we put the uh, financial update uh, next week. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it. You might notice that our giving is significantly down. Um, we are, like a lot of churches in the United States, we're having some challenges bouncing back from COVID in the physical but not in the spiritual realm. We are back. And I'm going to say we never left. God never left. The church never left. And, and so we are... Uh, excited about what God is doing in us and through us as a church. Uh, and next week, we'll talk a little bit about maybe some impacts and what that looks like uh, for our church body. But I don't want to take the time to do it today because we are starting a new sermon series. And so I want to take a few moments to just set the stage. Um, I'm going to ask everyone in the room, and this is going to bother some introverts, but I want you to, if you were not here last year when we went through the first uh, part of Joshua, it was a sermon series called Entering Into the Promise, where we went verse by verse through the first part of Joshua. If you were not here for that sermon series, will you raise your hand? That's a lot of people in the room. Uh, we have, we've gone back and we've taken all those services and we've edited them down to just the messages so that you can listen to them um, as you're walking or uh, as you're driving to work or whatever. If you want, you can go to our website and click on watch and it will take you to our YouTube channel where you can um, get uh, a little bit into what we talked about last year. As we looked at Joshua and we talked about entering into the promised, and we took about, I think about 12 weeks, 10 or 12 weeks to really look at the, the, the beginning of this book, and we're going to pick back up with a sermon series now, we're going to pick up in chapter 6, and this is, uh, this is part 2 of the sermon series, and we're, we're calling it Living in the Promised. 
So the first five chapters were entering into all that God promised and, and, and really what was required of people who were, who were longing to enter into what God had said he would do and the place where God had said he was going to take them. And we looked at that journey and it was a significant journey. Sometimes we read those stories and, and we just kind of like miss the, the weightiness of those were people like you and me who may have had a week like you just had this past week. May have gone through an intense job interview or maybe uh, a test, some physical test or something like that. Maybe a relational difficulty. Maybe a financial challenge. And, and, and sometimes we read these stories and we forget that these are people like you and I that are trying to serve God. They're trying to walk out that. What does that look like? They're dealing with some of the same challenges that you and I. And yet God was calling them to step into something they had never stepped into before. So if you've got the time and the interest, I encourage you to, to maybe look, look back at some of those, those um, Sundays and and I hope that it will bless you. As we dive into this morning, we're going to be picking up in chapter 6 of Joshua. And I think it's about page 204. If you didn't bring your Bible and you want to read along, there's all these Bibles, uh, these church Bibles around. They are large print. They are large print. So the, the scriptures will be on the screen as well. Uh, but before we do that, let me, let me tell you a little bit about the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is the first of what we know as historical books. The first five books of the Bible are, are called the Torah or the law of Moses, which really is the law of God that was communicated to Moses. And when we get to Joshua, this is the start of what scholars call the historical books. And this is where it starts recounting the narrative about how God moved in and through his people, the nation of Israel, and how they responded. And, and again, as we've talked about this so many times, uh, we, we know from the letters to Timothy that Paul says, all scripture is useful. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture can help us uh, be trained in righteousness, to, to, to be corrected when we need to be corrected, and to grow in our knowledge and in, in, our, in our relationship with God. All scripture is like that, including some of these Old Testament texts. And by the way, Jesus referred to the Old Testament many times, as well as Paul and Peter, and, and, and at the time of Christ... The only scripture they had was the Old Testament. So the Old Testament is rich, it's beautiful, and, and I want to tell you, the book of Joshua is one of the most profound, outstanding books, and this is why we took time last year, and this is why we're going to take about the next uh, 10 weeks or so to go through Joshua, because there's something that you and I can learn from this, because the promises of God are pretty unbelievable, amen? Amen? Like, like if you spend any time in, in, in the word and you, you start to hear what God says about who he is and what God says about who you are and about what God promises to do, that, that's pretty amazing. But there's something that's interesting. God promises, but we have to step into and we have to inhabit and we have to live in what he has set apart for us. So it's this, it's this both and. So we're going to learn what it looks like to begin to live in the promise. And so I'm going to do something this morning. We're going to dive into chapter 6. And I'm going to start at about verse 15. And I'm going to do something that you, you, you know, sometimes you see in the movies or whatever. Because, you know, we're jumping right into the middle of chapter 6. And we're jumping right into the, the, the battle. And I'm, I'm going to put battle in air quotes of Jericho and this fortified city, how the walls came down. And, and, and it's like, if, if we hadn't spent you know, any time at all getting to this moment, it's almost like, boom, you're dropped into the middle of an action scene. 
So it's kind of like a movie which, which starts you out from like the moment. Like have you ever been in a movie where like, you know, after, you know, the, the previews are done and after they tell you to turn off your cell phone and then everything goes black and then the movie kicks on, you know, have you ever been in one of those movies that's just like boom and it's just like in the middle of an action scene? right? They didn't take any time to like get you there. It's like, boom, you're in the middle of this epic scene and it plays out. And then a little bit after that, the scene changes and there's text on the screen that said three weeks earlier. And it kind of tells you like, wow, what went into this this moment, this, this powerful moment, and we're going to do that this morning, but we're going to jump into the action. Look at it with me in chapter 6 and verse 15. It says this, On the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Now we're not going to read it, but earlier in the chapter, what's taken place is the nation of Israel, hundreds of thousands of people are marching around. This is day seven, okay? So for six days they've been marching around Jericho. They've been camped on the western bank of the Jordan River. They've been camped, hundreds of thousands of people, by the way. Like sometimes we get in our mind these Bible stories and we're like, well, and there was 13 people and they walked through this. And no, this, this, you can see Jericho from the Jordan River. I've been there. It's, it's within, you, you can see it. It's several miles away. So they're camped, hundreds of thousands of people. They're camped. And for six days, they leave the camp marching in silence and they loop the city they march back to their camp now that in and of itself getting 10 people to walk around quiet is pretty amazing but hundreds of thousands of people so now this has been kind of a bizarre spectacle honestly like it doesn't really make a whole lot this isn't like military strategy 101 i got an idea Let's go walk around the enemy and not say a word. Day seven seemingly starts like the same way, but in the same way as they had done before, it says only on that day they marched around the city seven times. So instead of doing it once, they did it seven times. And on the seventh time, when the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you this city. That's going to be a key verse, and we're going to camp out on there today. Um, but let me, let me continue with our text. Verse 17 says, And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord. Some of the translations say, Set apart for the Lord. This is going to be a key. We're actually going to take two weeks to go through this text today. We're going to take two weeks to understand and unpack what it means for something or someone to be set apart for the Lord. And, and, and in this moment, Joshua is saying, shout, because God's given it to you. And then he says, the city and everything in it shall be set apart or devoted to the Lord for destruction. Wow. That kind of seems odd. We'll, we'll get into that. Only Rahab the prostitute and all that were with her in her house shall live because they hid the messengers whom we sent. But you, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things or set apart things, and you make a camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But the silver and gold, every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Verse 20. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. And as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell flat. So the people went into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Jump down to verse 24. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze 
and iron they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute in her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. In the midst of this epic scene, we see many, many layers about what it means for something to be set apart for God. And, and sometimes, and we're going to look at this, sometimes being set apart for God means it's got to die. It's got to be cut away. It's got to be eliminated. Sometimes it means it needs to be set apart and given to God. And in the midst of that, did you catch the fact that Rahab the prostitute was mentioned twice? How would you like that if your name wasn't Rahab something? It was Rahab the prostitute. You know, forever, forever in Scripture, you're known for maybe one of the low points in your life. Anybody have a low point? Do you want your name to include that low point? Can I just say that one of the reasons that her low point, I believe, is in the text and, and defined as part of her name and the historical record whenever she's referred to is because God is a God who redeems. God is a God who saves. God is the God who transforms, who takes us out of the worst possible scenario. And as we yield to him, he is a redemptive God. And we see this in the Old Testament. And you're like, well, I thought the Old Testament was all blood and guts and anger and God's just mad. Can I just tell you that the redemption story is all throughout Scripture. And we're going to look at that. Today, I want us to focus on how we got to this moment. So again, this is a huge, epic scene. This is hundreds of thousands of people walking around for six days in silence around a fortified city. It's kind of backed up, nestled against the cliffs on the west bank of the Jordan Valley. It is fortified. It is one of the ancient cities. It is on trade routes. It's a wealthy city. They're not lacking for resource. And all of a sudden, these people who have no home come in and have this bizarre strategy to take a city because that's what God said to do. And he moved and the walls came down and the city was theirs. But how we got to this moment is important for us because this isn't just a moment in the scripture, in the historical record that tells us about a battle that had to be fought. It's not just something in the historical records like, I wonder why that's in there. Uh, it's not something, I'm going to suggest, it's not something in the historical record. It's not something that is in the inspired scriptures for us to have today. Just so that you and I can go, wow, the power of God at work. And I'm going to suggest it wasn't even for the Israelites. It wasn't even for God's people to, to have this moment and go, wow, look what God did. That's pretty amazing. Those walls just. Whoo. Can I suggest they didn't need to be reminded again about the power of God? And this is why it's important for us to lay a little bit of foundation. And we're going to take our time to go over this one text. We're going to take two Sundays because I want us to, to see a little bit of the background. I want us to see a little bit of what went into this. Because this was yet just another moment in which God showed up in a big way. The children of Israel did not need to be reminded because of who God was. Because some walls came down. Can I just say a few days before he stopped the Jordan River. A few weeks before that, and the 40 years prior, they're eating food that mysteriously appears on the ground because God is feeding them. 40 years before that, God wipes out the Egyptian army by opening the Red Sea, letting a million plus people walk through it, and then closing it on the... These, these, they did not need the walls of Jericho to come down to be like, I didn't know God was so powerful. They didn't need that. 
So why is this here? I, I suggest that one of the reasons this is here for you and I to learn the same lesson that they needed to learn. What does it mean for, for something to be set apart for God in our life, in the world around us? What does that look like? Now turn with me a few pages back. We're going to jump. I, w- I want us to read just the... Joshua 1, verse 1, read a few verses because, again, this is a moment in which maybe you grew up in church and you know all about this story, but I, I want to lay the foundation of what's going on here. It says, after the death of, Josh, of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, he's their leader now, okay? So he was a lieutenant, so to speak, under Moses. And it says, uh, Moses, my servant, is dead, therefore go over this Jordan. This is while they're still, chapter one, they're still on the east bank. Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving them. Do you remember how I said, let's focus on the words where Joshua said, shout, because the Lord is giving you this city. This was the first city that was given to them in the land that was given to them. So it says, go into there. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, just as I promised Moses. And if you were here last year when we talked about this, go watch that sermon. Uh, Not because I preached it and it's awesome, uh, but because the truth in there is amazing how when when we are... We are to step into the promises of God. There's there's something that we physically sometimes need to do. And, and, And Joshua is told, literally, place your foot on the land. Everywhere where your soul, the sole of your foot touches, you're gonna get. There's something that you and I have to do when God promises. It's not that we earn it. It's not like that at all. It's not, it's just God says, here it is. Are you gonna by faith step into it? That's the question. And by the way, this ends up being true. Everywhere that they stepped into, they were able to have. But as we're going to see as the series unfolds, there were some areas that were like, I don't know about that. I don't know if we could take that. And it ended up coming back to bite them because because God's just saying, take it. Take it. So he's saying everywhere where your foot touches, and he goes on to describe it, from the wilderness of this Lebanon as far as the great river to the river Euphrates, the land of the Hittites to the great sea, that's the Mediterranean Sea, going towards down to the sun will be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. That is a bumper sticker verse right there. I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a coffee mug. That's a bumper sticker. We like to quote that verse as Christians. Can I, you hear me all the time talk about the importance of context. I love that verse too. Let's, let's think about it in the, in the realm of context here. Because God is saying, I'm going to never, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. But what's he asking them to do? Can you trust me? I've got this for you. Will you step into this? Will you just believe me? When I say that this is what I have for you, will you just believe me? Will you step into it? I will never leave you or forsake you because sometimes stepping into it is scary. Amen? Have you ever stepped into it? Like you're like, I don't know what's coming next. I literally don't know. I have no clue, but God's, I know in my heart, God is saying, step into this. I, uh, but God promises that he won't leave or forsake Joshua. And he says, be strong and courageous for you shall cause this people to inherit the land I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous. Be careful to do all the law that my Moses servant has commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The reason I'm taking the time this morning is to to lay a little bit of background is because I believe that we're going to see a little bit of ourselves over the coming weeks in the people of God. As they believe God and they step into stuff, and, and what happens when we completely trust God, we completely obey God, and we move into that, and then what happens when we, you know, kind of lose it for a moment, we forget, 
who God is and what he said about himself, about us, about what he promised. We forget that a little bit. We start, you know, and, and, and so we're going to learn. We're going to learn from this. But he says, don't depart from this. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. So you be careful to do according all that is written in it. For then you will make, he will make your way prosperous and you will, then you will have good success. Have I not commanded it? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua takes the mantle from Moses. Moses doesn't come into the promised land. Joshua is the new leader. Joshua has this amazing download and pep talk from God himself. God is saying, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. Three times, ten verses, be strong and courageous. Why is that? Because sometimes stepping out is scary. Sometimes, and with everything in us, we want to believe that God is, yep, you're in this, it's true, it's in your word, you've confirmed it in my, in my spirit, your Holy Spirit is leading me into this, but sometimes I need to be reminded to be strong and courageous. But I want you to see, it says, that, that you will inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. So before we get to chapter 6, where the walls came down, and if you grew up in church, you probably know that story. Before you ever get there, you have to understand that this isn't just a city that needed to fall. This was a gift from God. It was the first city, then a land that was a gift from God. And this is telling us a little bit about God, because by the way, this is a promise. We see it right here that I swore. This is God saying, I swore to their fathers to give them. So we're going to look at that. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 13. And this is going back hundreds of years. Have you ever been in a situation where you feel like God has promised something, but it's taken a little while to develop? Have you ever waited hundreds of years? So in Genesis 13, verse 14, it says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look to the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. So Abram, at this time, God hadn't changed his name to Abraham yet. Abram and his nephew Lot, they are, they are herdsmen. They are Bedouins. They are nomads. So they are wealthy herdsmen and nomads and they have a lot of livestock and and they have to they're so so big their tribe is so big that they kind of have to separate the family's like okay you're gonna go here I'm gonna go here and God takes Abram on this journey and he's in the hill country of Israel which would in modern day Israel which was called Canaan at the time he's up in the hill country and God makes a promise to him and says hey look as far as you can look east west north south this land this land, verse 15, for the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. God is promising Abram that he's going to give him this, this land called Canaan. I will make your offspring as dust of the earth so that no one can count the dust of the earth. Your offspring will also not be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of this land for I will give it to you. I love this, this moment here because it's, it echoes what we saw in Joshua 1. Joshua's told what? Everywhere where the sole of your foot touches, you will have. Hundreds of years before, Abram has told by God, God says, hey, as far as you can see it, I'm going to give it to you. Now, what do I want you to do? I want you to walk the land. I want you to step into it. Now, a couple weeks ago, we, we were looking at Jacob, and we're talking about how we respond when we encounter God, right? And so in the middle of uh, that dream that we talked about, where, where Jacob has this encounter with God, that is in Genesis 28, and um, it says this in verse 13, in the middle of Jacob's dream, we read this a couple weeks ago, and behold, the Lord stood above the ladder and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Remember, Jacob woke up from that dream. Remember, he's on the run. He's been sleeping out, rock for his pillow, 
And he has this powerful encounter with God. And, he, and he's like, I didn't even know God was here. Now, in the midst of God revealing himself, God re- reiterated the promise to his grandfather. Do you think it's any coincidence that Jacob is in the hill country of Canaan when he's on the run? Because he made a mess at home with his family. He just threw a grenade in the middle of all those relationships. And now he's on the run. And, and, and he has this encounter with God. And in that dream, he happens to be at the same place where God says, this is the land. It's promised. You see, so by the time we get to Jericho, this is a promise that has, has, has taken centuries to come about. But God is faithful. God is absolutely faithful. In Numbers 13 and 14, we're not going to go there, but, but this is an interesting moment because fast forward, again, we're trying to work our way back to Jericho, but fast forward now. Okay, so, so what's happened is Jacob, we talked about a couple weeks ago, has this powerful encounter with God. God blesses him. He has 12 sons, which would eventually be the forefathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those ends up in Egypt. Eventually, because of famine and a bunch of other stuff, all of this entire family would end up in Egypt and stay there for hundreds of years, and they would become a great people, and then they would be oppressed, and they would be put into slavery. And then God releases them. And God uses Moses and they go out into the wilderness and God does those miracles we were talking about. He parts the Red Sea. He takes them on their journey. They get to the promised land, ding, 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 round one. You see, because by the time we get to the book of Joshua, this is the second time they've come to the promise that God had for them. The first time is actually in Numbers 14, uh, 13 and 14. And what happens is, by the way, they're only a few weeks away from Mount Sinai. A couple of hundred thousand people could actually get from Mount Sinai to the edge of the promised land in a couple of weeks. Which they did. And then Moses sends 12 spies into the land. They go into the land, 12 come back. Two of them are like, well, actually all 12 are like, God's promise, wow, it's pretty amazing. You should see it. It is amazing. But 10 of the 12 didn't think that God would actually come through. Joshua was one of those. Joshua was like, don't, don't, don't turn your back on God in this moment. Don't, this is not the time to shrink back. Yeah, there's enemies in the land. But God is bigger than that. And God said he'd do it. Unfortunately, some of us, myself included, sometimes it takes God a couple of times. Have you ever had to go do your version of a lap through the wilderness? I have. That's why I love the Old Testament stories that are in here because it shows normal people like you and I and how God works supernaturally in very natural situations and in very natural, normal people. So now we get to Joshua. We get to this scene. Now, a few days before, just a few days before, the walls came down. God did an epic thing. It's in it's in chapter 3, and we're not going to look there. I, I'm not going to re-preach the whole first sermon series, but, but there are some key moments that I want to highlight as we prepare to go into the next one. And that is, in chapter 3, it talks about the Jordan River being parted. See, God brought them all this whole way, and, and, and sometimes we, we, we read these stories, and we just read past them pretty quick, but, but 
there was an instruction that the priests were to carry the ark into the Jordan River. And it was at flood stage, by the way. And they, and they were just to step into the water and that God was going to stop the water. And it was this moment of faith and this moment of trust. And they could see the promised land. They see it right there. And yet they have to step in the water. And, and Joshua gets everybody ready. And the instructions are, the priests are going to go first. The ark of the covenant is going to go. And then, then what's going to happen is, is God's going to make a way and we're going to all go. Now again, sometimes we think about these in kind of fairy tale like qualities. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. And in chapter 3, it says the water literally did stop when the priests put their foot in the water all the way up to a city called Adam. Scholars think they have found that city. There's two locations that could possibly be that city. One is 10 miles up the Jordan River. The other, I think, is 26 miles up. So it says God stopped the water all the way to Adam and the nation of Israel went across. So I want us to think about this for a second. If you've ever been to Kings Canyon, 26 miles is about a third of the way to Kings Canyon National Park. Think about driving from Fresno to Kings Canyon and imagine a river being next to the road that's wider than the San Joaquin River. Maybe not quite as big as the Mississippi, but it's a big river. And for 26 miles, the first 26 miles that you're driving to Kings Canyon, all of a sudden the river is completely dry. This is a miracle of epic proportions. And what happened is the nation of Israel, listen, the nation of Israel did not go through this narrow little like 10 foot wide section of the river. Do you know how long that would take? Anybody been to an NFL football game? Well, like 80,000 people ever tried to make it to the restroom? Yes, I'm sorry. The pastor just talked about the bathroom at the pulpit. I'm sorry. But you know what I'm saying? It's like it takes forever. This wasn't like that. 26 miles of the river dried up and hundreds of thousands of people just went across the river. And they camped. Jericho's in the distance. Now, the first thing that they did was they reinstituted the covenant relationship with God by by doing circumcision again, which they hadn't done, which is just bizarre. This was one of the things that God said, you need to do. And we we dove into that last year. Uh, That's significant. Even more significant probably is in uh, in chapter five where they, they do the Passover. This is a beautiful picture of God reminding them that as they're stepping into a new season, God is faithful. He took care of you. This Passover is saying, do you remember? And a lot of them don't because they hadn't even been born yet. But, but do you remember and have you heard stories about how our entire nation were slaves in Egypt? And the Passover talks about the salvation of God, how God rescues people he takes them out of bondage he takes them out of literal slavery spiritual slavery physical slavery god does this amazing thing and every year they practice the the passover as a recognition of god you're the god who saves i cannot save myself i was helpless in egypt there was nothing i can do but you're the god who saved and it's a reminder it's it's again this is a bizarre military strategy because they The city can see them. The city knows there's an army now. They have lost all element of surprise. You would think that that you would like, okay, we got across the river. Boom. High five God. That was awesome. Okay, now let's go take the city quick. No, God's like, pause. Let's just take a moment and remember that I'm a God who saves. I'm the God who rescues. And the Passover points to Jesus, as we know in the New Testament. He is the Passover lamb. He is the one who who saves us. Like, we didn't deserve it. We were in bondage. We were in prison. We, We couldn't rescue ourselves. We could not. So what's interesting is before they ever get to this battle, God's reminding them who he is and that he's a God who saves and we're going to wrap it up next week, but because we need to take some time to linger in this moment. Because everything 
up until this point, everything before the battle of Jericho takes place points to God saying, I got you. I got you. And as you come into that which I promised centuries before, and as you begin to start to taste this, this amazing land, which you, you sent spies to four decades before, as you begin to see what is in store for you, I need you to set apart something for me. But in verse, back in chapter 6, and in verse 16, it says, the seventh time they went around, the priest had blown the trumpets, and Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. You see, the reason we took the time to to build in the background is because we needed to understand the weightiness of this moment. This wasn't just a normal city. This wasn't just a normal battle. This was something that God gave. This was a taste of the promised land. And what we see in this, like what is the takeaway for you and I today? Like how do we apply this story? The first thing that we need to to realize is that God keeps his promises. 100%. God never, never, never backed away from the promise. Now, people were trying to figure it out. You know what? And I think one of the reasons um, that Jericho went down like it did was because of the second thing that we need to learn from this and that sometimes stepping out in faith, what God is calling us to do doesn't make sense, okay? So let's say we, we get that first truth and we understand, okay, God never breaks his promises. God, God is yes and amen in scripture. Okay, God is gonna do it. I believe it. I, I'm full of faith. Okay, now, now, now let me just help out God a little bit. Anybody been in that moment? God, yes, you said it. Let's do it. All right, let me help you out. Sometimes stepping out in faith requires us to do things that don't make sense. They got to this point. Jericho was a prize. A city, like I said, at the crossroads of some major trade routes. It was fortified. It was a wealthy city. It was, you know what? Never in their wildest dreams would they imagine the way that that city would become theirs was they walk around it in silence. But that's what the life of faith is. If God says it, let's do it. Let's not try to always figure it out. So what, where would we be? What would Joshua chapter 6 look like if they had a powwow? And they got to this point. And, and Joshua's like, I just heard this from God. And by the way, so what he wants us to do is send the ark first, and then we're supposed to march around the city, and we're not supposed to say a word. We're supposed to do that for seven days. What if the people around had a little powwow, like they did 40 years before, when the, tw- the, the 12 spies went into them? What if they had a little powwow and be like, you know what, that just absolutely does not make sense. I believe God, but I, I cannot, I can't wrap my mind around this. He's asking us to do something that just doesn't make sense. Can I just say that is the life of faith? Faith, by definition, doesn't make sense, right? Because if it completely makes sense, then you don't need faith, right? If you can add everything up, then you just, there it is. There's the answer. No, faith requires God saying, hey, I'm going to do this, and I want you to do this in this way, and we'd be like, okay, I don't see it, but I'm going to step in, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to invite the worship team up at this point, and I want us to see the last thing. When Joshua said, shout, God has given you the city. Now, next week, we're going to look into what we read earlier about there was part of the city that needed to be set apart. And I'm just going to say right up front that sometimes this walk of faith means that, that there is there's an aspect that God's going to ask you to, to let some things go in your life. 
He's going to say, this thing that is in front of you, you need to kill it. It needs to die. It's, it's, it's not a part of what I have for you. You need to let it go. And then some of the things are going to be set apart. We're going to look at this, but let me just say this. That it all hinges on us understanding that God gave them the city. God gave them the promised land. God got them out of slavery. God did, God did, God did. I can imagine a moment in which somebody's looking at this going, are you kidding me? Okay, it's crazy to think that we're going to take this city by walking around in silence. But then after we take it, you, we can't have any of it? How does that make sense? Can I just say, God will never ask you to set apart something that he hasn't already given you. God, God is the one that brought this and he said, set this apart. God is the one that gave this. Can you imagine like the people that were indignant and we're gonna dive into this more next week, please come back. But the people that were indignant about like, well, why can't we have any of this? And sometimes people don't follow Jesus because of what they can't have. Honestly, they're like, I don't know if I can do that because I don't wanna give up this. I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I, I, that, I don't know that I can do that. Imagine for a second, they're sitting in the promised land and God's like, you can't have this city. And getting into this moment, we're like, I can't believe we can't have this city. Like, whoa, time out, dude, for a second. What if God hadn't come through? Would you rather be, you know, what if you were born in Egypt in slavery? Look, everything that you're about to experience is God giving it to you. You need to put something aside. But God never asked us. God never asked us to sacrifice something that he hasn't given us. You think about anything in your life other than sin. I'm not talking about sin. But think about anything in your life that he's asking you to let go of and ask yourself the question, what has God done for me to get me to this point? So I'm gonna ask you to stand and I, I want us to pray. I hope that this challenges us in a good way this morning. But let's pray. God, we come before you and I just pray that you would just help us. I just pray that we would be reminded, God, of who you are. God, and in the same way that, that after the nation crossed the Jordan River, you had them pause and remember that you're a God that saves. And God, I know that there are many of us in this room that are facing things. That we, we, we may feel like we're facing battles. We may feel like we're facing an impenetrable fortress. God, we, some of us feel like we have our back against the wall. And I pray that you would speak to each person in this room, God. And I pray that you would remind them of your faithfulness. You would remind them of your promises. The promises that have been spoken over their life through scripture, the promises that have been spoken over their life prophetically, the promises that have been spoken and whispered into their ear by your sweet Holy Spirit, that they would believe who you are, who you say that you are, and that you do what you say that you're going to do, God. God, help us to walk into this moment with a faith. When things don't make sense, God, when things don't make sense, God, help us to step forward. And I pray that if anybody feels lost this morning, if anybody feels like they don't know your love, God, will you reveal yourself to them? Will you show yourself strong? God, will you comfort? Will you come alongside? Will you be the God that heals? And will you be God that save, the God that saves? And everyone said, amen. Let's worship.